recognize a few folks, and then I want to introduce Dr. Lewis. Um, History Day is an annual event. This is the fourth time we've held one of these gatherings, and we moved around the state last spring. We were up in Valley Cruces and telling the story of um, uh, Bishop Ives and uh, the mission uh, work that took place in the mountains of North Carolina. And in two years, a uh, year before that, we were um, in Fayetteville, and I see my friend Robert Alvis has just walked in, uh, and um, we were telling the earlier part of the, the story of the dying. So every year, and this will continue for several more years, we've gathered on an annual basis try to pull together Episcopalians across our state to uh, highlight a particular aspect of the history of the Episcopal Church in North Carolina. And all of this is leading up to a bicentennial observance in April of 2017, when we will gather in Newburgh, which is where the first organizing convention for the Episcopal Church uh, took place. So, uh, um, in addition to Robert and Lynn, are there other members of the Tri-Diocesan Steering Committee present? All right. But we also have a History and Archives Committee for our diocese. I'd like all those people to stand and be recognized. So please, remember that I love It's an ancient and 
venerable tradition. So, <laughs> so History Day falls into that category, and I think more guys that should do that and appreciate uh, for when that comes. It's good to be back at St. Augustine's. I've been here a million times in various capacities. I worked at the team and uh, meetings with the Union Black Italians. And I've seen people through the congregation here today. Somebody said, I remember you when you came to the St. Stephen's Winters from Salem. I said, oh, that was about 50 pounds ago. <laughs> <laughs> but it, it's good to be here. In order to best understand how the Episcopal Church attempted to minister to African Americans between the wars, that is to say the Civil War and the First World War, we cannot begin the study in 1865. We must instead consider the more than 200 years of American history before the Civil War, during which the Church's theology of mission was, was forged. It must be remembered that, as Charlton Hayden points out, the Society of Propagation of the Gospel in Foreign Parts, known as the SPG, uh, the Missionary Society primarily responsible for work in the American colonies, uh, that organization accepted slavery as a vital factor in British prosperity. And its practices and strategies were designed to accommodate itself to that fact. In other words, the its theology of mission was driven by economics. Indeed, the most charitable thing that could be said about the church's attitude towards blacks in the early colonial period was that it treated the slave with ambivalence. For while slaves were incorporated into the body of Christ through the sacrament of baptism, the church's ostensible concern for blacks' future blessedness, as somebody once described it, had to be weighed against energetic endeavors at the same time to make them exist solely for the benefit of those who purported to evangelize them. So in other words, he were baptizing slaves, preaching salvation in the street by and by, but meanwhile telling them they were bound to be slaves and faithful slaves at that. In 1727, Edmund Gibson, the Bishop of London, uh, who, of course, had spiritual jurisdiction over the colonies, virtually removed every vestige of ambivalence in this matter in a letter to some of his major parishioners, the Virginia planters, uh, who had expressed some concern that the allusion to the word freedom in the baptismal rite might be taken by some to be tantamount to manumission. So he wrote the following to clear up the matter. He said, Christianity and the embracing of the gospel does not make the least alteration in civil property or in any of the duties which belong to civil relations. But in all these respects, it continues persons just in the same state as it found them. The freedom which Christianity gives is freedom from the bondage of sin and Satan and from the dominion of men's lusts and passions and inordinate desires. But as to their outward condition, whatever that was before, whether bond or free, their being baptized and being Christian make no manner of change in it. And so far as Christianity from discharging them from the duties of the station and condition in which it found them, that it lays them under stronger obligations to perform those duties with the greatest diligence and fidelity. 